So, hello everyone, I am Matthew, I'm a PhD student at the University of Glasgow. Um, I'm in my second year and I'm going to talk to you about the inspiration behind my PhD. And uh, before I started the PhD, uh, my master's was in a completely different field. I uh, researched consensus algorithms in the uh, perspective of distributed computing. And I was very interested in verification of these kinds of algorithms. And I was quite unsatisfied with uh, the level of verification I could get through the methods I was looking at in my master's degree. And I decided to try and approach the problem from the side of behavioral types. And that's what inspired uh, my PhD proposal. And the aim of this talk is to make everyone aware of why typing consensus algorithms is a bit tricky, um, the problems that can be addressed, the problems I'm trying to address, and just inspire some uh, discussion and conversation around it, is my aim. So, uh, Nobuko inspired me to add an extra slide in this, which I added yesterday, because uh, she had a slide on uh, SMTP, um, simple mail transfer protocol, right? And that was described in about 50 pages, I think you said on the... Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, so, yes, so consensus algorithms are quite uh, notorious for being rather complex, so much so that they don't even have official descriptions, not even in English. If you want to try and figure out how one works, you have to look at the papers in which they're published. For instance, uh, probably considered the first consensus algorithm, Paxos, designed by Leslie Lamport. Uh, it was described in this paper, the part-time parliament. No one understood this. And so, many more papers were published trying to make it more accessible and easy to understand so people can implement it correctly. Uh, after which, people gave up. And, uh, uh, make a whole new consensus algorithm which tries to make things a bit more easy to understand. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> there's a, yes, people find a lot of difficulty in implementing these things correctly. And that is the aim of session types, right? Uh, we, we want to help people implement these complex protocols correctly. <laughs> so, I know everyone's familiar with what session types are, but maybe not everyone knows how consensus algorithms work, so I have a small demonstration. Well, a consensus algorithm works for uh, distributed uh, nodes, which are connected over some network, which can be prone to failure. And the aim of the consensus algorithm is to get these nodes to make group decisions, right? And typically, one node will propose some value. For instance, this node decides, I want to change color to red. And if one node proposes a value and everyone likes it and agrees with it, the consensus algorithm has a guarantee that some majority will agree to also change color to red. So one guarantee is we have this notion of safe replication. So if a decision is committed, then it should be on a majority of nodes. Well, why do we want this guarantee? It's to provide some amount of fault tolerance. Right? So if we have one node that goes down, well, if we query what is the color that was <laughs> chosen, we should still get red, even though one node failed. Right? And so we have fault tolerance guarantees. And lastly, a very important guarantee is that if uh, some node goes rogue and decides, okay, let me try propose a new color, I want to propose blue, then it should not be able to override everyone else just on its own. So it should eventually come back to speed with the group decision, turn red, and so we have this idea of commit safety. That is, if some uh, decision was made, then this decision should be made by everyone eventually. 
So this is what a consensus algorithm really is, right? But so why is it difficult to type? Why why is it so hard to write <coughs> session types for these kinds of protocols that uh, are very meaningful, right? That describe a lot of interesting things about the protocol. And I wrote down some reasons as to why I have found it difficult myself. And the four most uh, important points, I guess, are that many consensus algorithms rely on these things, right? So, firstly, we have failure detection. So, since the protocols are designed to be fault tolerant, the protocol is dependent on some kind of detection of failure, or some kind of assumption that uh, it can make to say, oh, some failure happened, then I will change my protocol and do something else. Also, protocols are largely dependent on cluster size, uh, so this will affect the, the design of the protocol and making uh, a session type agnostic of how many participants are in it is rather tricky. Also, commonly, there is a large dependency on payload values. So, the protocol itself can change depending on specific values that are passed inside the messages. And lastly, probably the biggest point is that consensus algorithms have to employ non-deterministic behavior. There's a very common uh, uh, property inside a lot of distributed algorithms that uh, these algorithms cannot be symmetrical without having non-determinism. So, it's a must. We can't get around it. So, my first attempt at trying to write uh, session types for a consensus algorithm uh, was at ESOP 23, where I uh, developed MagPy, which is a multi-party, asynchronous, and generalized pi calculus. Uh, and the idea of this was to develop a calculus and type system that can reason about failures. So for these four points that I mentioned over here, I was really addressing this failure detection and this non-determinism. And how does MagPy do this? Well, in our calculus, uh, I just put down the interesting parts. In our calculus, we have an inbuilt notion of timeouts. So a timeout can be very powerful. Uh, using a timeout, you can introduce non-deterministic behavior, and you can also use it as a method of assuming something went wrong. I haven't received my message because something went wrong, so I'll time out. I'll just briefly explain the syntax uh, from the left. C is a channel which you are using to receive. In this case, I only put the, the, the receives noted by the ampersand. We have undirected branching, which says uh, you can see by quantification over the row Q. So we're saying using channel C, I will receive from some Q the message M right, with payload values. And the interesting thing is the bottom one where we can have a nice little clock which denotes a time. Standard local types, as you would expect, with the, again, undirected branching for roles, so you can expect a message from different participants. And we have this clock again in our session type, which allows us to describe a failure handling branch. So in the case that some failure was assumed, then we can take this timeout branch and continue according to S prime. Okay. So, using MagPy, <coughs> oops, okay. Using MagPy, I set out to try and uh, express a write a consensus algorithm. Right? That that was the aim of it. So I gave Raft a try. Raft is a consensus algorithm which or was originally designed to be understandable in some to some extent. Right? It provides fault tolerance 
for f nodes in a cluster of 2f plus 1. So that means as long as a simple majority of the nodes remain alive, we can assume all those assumptions I mentioned earlier. And how we're oft works is that every single node runs its own state machine, and what the algorithm does is make sure that this state machine is replicated across the whole cluster. So, what I'm going to do now is give you a very brief demonstration of a sub-protocol of this algorithm. Since it uses a leader election to decide the leader that will take decisions for the whole cluster, uh, the leader election side of it is a very core part to the algorithm. And so I will demonstrate this, and we can see how can we type this leader election protocol in the consensus algorithm. So the algorithm defines three states that the node can be in at any time. These are the follower, candidate, or leader states, and I use these colors to represent them. And we can see a small demonstration of how it works. This is uh, three nodes. You can see a number zero associated with all of them. If you were present at Chintzia's uh, talk yesterday, uh, you might remember the notion of logical time steps. These are pretty much the same thing, so every node starts at time zero. They all start with non-deterministic timeouts, and if they don't receive anything within a number, a certain amount of randomized time, then they will time out and do something interesting. So we saw the first node timed out first, and so it decided, hey, no one is doing anything, I'm going to try to become a leader. So what it does, it promotes the candidate, it increases its time value, so it's at time one, and what it does is it's going to send request votes to everyone else in the cluster. These followers, <coughs> since they were still waiting for a message, they received these votes and were like, yeah, sure, this sounds, this sounds good. So they increased their time values to one, and they're going to respond to the candidate positively. So they will send acknowledgments back to the candidate, and once it receives a majority of votes, it promoted the leader. And it's happy and is going to uh, be the governing body of the cluster from here. So, this is the leader election protocol in a nutshell. Can we put a type on it? Well, that <coughs> simple demonstration, right, has already quite a, a, big, a big type to it. But I can walk you through a little bit of it. So, remember, we had these three different states, follow, cal follower, candidate, leader. We can denote these, uh, we can mimic this kind of state using recursive variables. So, on the left, you'll see a mu f. This is the follower. Uh, side of the protocol. It begins and it will wait for a message from any of the other two uh, any of the other two nodes, i and j. And at the top I have, if it receives a request for a vote from i, then it can reply with either yes or no. No matter what it does, it just recurses back to f. It doesn't do anything. Yet. And it does the same thing for, for other messages, right? but in the candidate state, right, uh, if it, to become a candidate, it had to not receive a message for an amount of time, assume no one is active, and say, okay, I'm going to take the lead on this. And this can be seen using the timeout. So if I start up and I don't receive anything in an amount of time, I will time out, and there's the new recursive binder of UC. This represents the candidate state. And it sends request for vote messages to everyone else in the cluster. And it waits for replies. If it receives yes votes, then it will promote the leader. And this promote the leader I denoted with a hole in the session type, so that can be filled in later. I didn't bother filling out the whole thing because there's already problems here, as I will show you. But yes, so the candidate, it uh, waits for these replies. Again, if, uh, n if it doesn't receive any replies because failures happen, whatever, 
it will go back to C and send request for votes again. And this more or less conforms to the protocol description, but I am not satisfied. Right? There are imprecisions in this. The reason why I want the session type is so that it makes sure I write the protocol as accurately as possible. But there are many things that this session type, although it might type check my protocol, there are many things it does not force me to do. And I don't like the imprecision. And so what I would like is something more like this. Remember those term numbers that we saw, 0 and 1? When I promoted the candidate, I increased my term value. Well, these are integral to making decisions, and they're integral to uh, changing the protocol continuation type. So what I would like is a session type that can do something like this. Right? So if a candidate were to receive a yes vote from one of the followers, it should not assume that that yes vote is valid. Why? Because if I receive the yes vote for the previous election, then I should not promote the candidate. And that could not be described if we don't reason about term numbers. Not only do we get to describe things like that, well, also, if we look at the follower side, the very top line, earlier, in the previous slide, I just had the, a branch type, sorry, a selection type, I said either I reply with yes or no. Now, with something like this, we could be more precise, right? We say, oh, well, only reply with a yes if the term number of your vote is greater than the one you have. Otherwise, well, why would I vote for you, right? And I can make sure the programmer conforms to these things because they're integral to the correctness of the algorithm. Right, so these are cool. They look nice. But what actually can they be, right? So, these are proposed syntax, uh, and uh, these are possible ways of finding meaning to them, right? What, what can they really be? Well, can, can, can we reason about them through dependent typing? Well, maybe, right? So dependent types would allow us to request more information about what we are, uh, about these term numbers and about them. But dependent types also are very heavy. They come with their own problems. So maybe, maybe it's uh, too much. Maybe we don't need to go that far. So we could also think about them through refinements, right? refinement typing. And there is some work on refinement typing in MPSTs. And maybe this is enough. We would really have to sit it through, try it out, and try write the protocol again. Um, refinement typing will allow you to make uh, Boolean conditions or conditions on the payloads that you're passing. So you can change your protocol based on conditions of these term numbers, which would be nice. Or else, another idea I had is uh, taking inspiration from epistemic logic. And if we had some kind of epistemic modalities which we could introduce into the session types, then we could maybe reason about beliefs and belief systems inside this type. Why is this helpful? Well, whenever I receive a message from someone with uh, some particular term number, then I can hold the belief that they have this term number. And I can maybe change my protocol based on my belief system. And I say I have the belief because, remember, this is a system prone to failure. And if I receive a message with term number 5, that does not mean that you currently have term number five. It's you had it when you sent that message, but things could have changed. So these are just some ideas I have. I am very interested to see what kind of ideas uh, the community <coughs> might have. And if you have any points of discussion, please let me know. Otherwise, I am done with my talk. I thank you very much for listening. Thank you.
So since this is runtime checking, I'm not sure we're going to follow that protocol, right? <laughs> Yeah, so as I mentioned to you, I implemented Raft also in a mm -hmm. session type system, the one that Stephanie and I designed on with shared session types. Um, and there was really no problem doing the implementation. So the way we model communication is a, there's a single shared process. It represents a network. And um, the way we get non-blocking communication that the process asks, do you have a message for me? And it, uh, the, the network will say, no, or it will say possibly yes. That's why in my talk I had this type store, which is kind of a universal type for communication once you have shared channels. So we got non-blocking input in that way, so we could represent certain things. And we could mm -hmm. also represent failure by simply this central process representing the network dropping messages, which is entitled to do, or replicating messages, sending it twice. So the protocol had to be resistant to those kind of attacks. And then you can play with the parameters and you can see the usual graphs that, they, that um, Ongaro, for example, saw when he implemented his session types. So, um, so first of all, the good news is that with this very simple change of having shared session types, we were able to get a representation of, of the RAP protocol. Um, but the same thing that you found, we found as well, which is that um, the types make sure that messages are understood but they don't talk about what the messages actually mean, yeah. okay? So it can be well typed and you know when you get a message, oh, it's the correct form mm -hmm. um, and things like that, which is I think already an important guarantee when you compare it to other implementations. And um, for example, there's no problem to compile this on the back end. Our, our compiler from currency not produces either C with P threads <coughs> or it produces a Go using Go routines. So you can run it in either of these configurations. And there's really no problem doing that. Um, but this is still very far from having correctness proof for the protocol. Mm -hmm. And I think trying to say that the session type has to contain the correctness proof, I think that's too much to ask, okay? okay. Sort of like even a functional type system, right? Mm -hmm. Until we go to a full Martin Left type theory, right? The types guarantee you a lot about the interfaces, about how you call functions and things like that without guaranteeing you, well, if I call this function log, it will back something. If I take it to the power of two, I get my, you know, the result that I want. It doesn't guarantee you those kind of properties. So maybe we're asking for too much if you want to get all these properties into the type. Maybe we should be happy that we have communication, um, you know, um, soundness, a type soundness. And maybe there's a separate research project on how to prove the correctness of these things, but maybe trying to fold it all into one is not a realistic goal. Um. Okay. Um, so I agree with the fact that, yes, it is very important that uh, we can write session types that uh, give us these, at least uh, this line of guarantees that you mentioned, right? So at least... Uh, we're not getting any unexpected messages. We can handle our payloads, right? But, so in terms of asking for too much, maybe. But I do think it would be a pity if we don't find out where that line is. So where is the line of asking for too much? And how far can we go? So I am interested in figuring out that if this is too much to ask for, then figuring out reasons why it's too much to ask for and why it can't be done and seeing the boundary of till where can we take it. Yeah, well, it's also, also asking too much of the developer, right? I mean, the reason that you, the systems people that you work with don't write their protocols in talk mm -hmm. is because it's too much to ask of them, right? You give them... Yes. Um, but, yes, so, just on this, uh, if we had some kind of generalized system, right, uh, we don't need uh, our uh, developers to write the protocols. In the we don't need them to write the full session type. We, uh, as the protocol designers and people looking to verify these things, we can write these session types. We can write these protocols. And uh, we can work on, on ways of making, building a bridge between a generalized type that can be spread around different uh, languages and implemented in, in, in different implementations. Thank you for the talk. So uh, actually, it's, it's a bit of follow-up on what Frank was saying. So 
So, I, so I got from your talk that it's important for you to, to have a, a hold of the terms, right? Yes, yes. But this is, this is something that people doing in the analysis of security protocols have already realized a long time ago, you see, because they use the apply by calculus. And, uh, and the kind of concern that you have, like, this is real, really the, the, the message that I want, they frame that as, a, as an integrity property. And they have a lot of tooling and they have a lot of, I mean, I would say almost two decades of experience in, in, in this kind of thing. So essentially, you, they, they use something very rudimentary, you could say, like the applied by calculus, in order to model all those things. Of course, they're targeting a, a certain level of abstraction, right? So that was also part of uh, Frank's comment, right? So you, mm -hmm. you, have a, you, you give different priority and you, you look at different levels of abstraction with different formalisms. Right, so I was wondering, my question is specifically, have you looked into how people have used the apply by calculus to formalize these kind of things or, or these kind of protocols? Because there, for sure, you need to reason about terms and you pass around terms, actually. So I have not looked specifically into apply by calculus and how they do that in that setting. But yes, I will definitely take a look at this for inspiration. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, this is maybe just a, a complementary uh, option as well. So mm -hmm. the thing is we get these types protocols that get quite complicated and they contain things like even calculations as part of the specification or other decision procedures and that's why it's getting hard to verify in the implementation. And so some of the approaches that people have used, uh, things like code generation or type generation, if you've got that thing in the type and you want process to follow that, actually that's also one option in some cases where you, you can generate com some, some of the components or part of the implementation and it's correct by construction. It might be a bit crude in some sense, but uh, it may be practical as well. Yes. So there is, there is some work, especially e even in raft of uh, correct by construction generation of the raft consensus algorithm. Uh, but yes, I, I personally think it's a crude way of doing it like you. Thanks. Thanks for your talk. It's very interesting. May I ask you for an opinion? Because you said, like you did in your master's, look into consensus protocols and how to verify those. Like the term number thing of RAF reminds me of this round based verification approaches where, like, communication closed rounds. I guess you know what I mean by that? Um, communication taking part in, in closed rounds, you said? Like communication closed rounds where you can discharge any message that is like older than something because you progress further. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. so there are these like two approaches that come to mind. One is like P-Sync with a follow-up on resync with Byzantine folds um, and the other is like pretend synchrony. Do you remember them and like, because I wonder like what you, what you mean by that you found them unsatisfactory. Oh, okay, so let me explain myself a bit more there. So what I found unsatisfactory is uh, the, the, the approach that I was taking back then. So my approach back then was developing uh, runtime monitors <coughs> for, for, for uh, consensus protocols. And uh, what I did is I developed a runtime monitor and attached it to my implementation of, of Raft. And the guarantees that you could get out of runtime verification uh, were also uh, limited to some extent. And uh, what I wanted to do was try a different approach. And an approach that seemed more effective into the development life cycle. And I thought that type systems and behavioral types fit that perfectly, and so that's what I meant by unsatisfactory. Okay. So it's time to move to the next talk. Uh, thank you, Martin. <laughs> <laughs>